just going to wait a second to get a couple more people into the regular room, but to get things going, I want to make sure that everybody can hear me and also use the chat feature. So this is actually how we're going to interact today. So if you guys want to let me know where you're calling from, that would be great. It also gives an idea of other people that are on the call today. So if you have any questions throughout the lunch, this is actually going to be the place where you type it in and I will be interrupting our presenter to ask those questions. Um, don't worry about that. Just make sure you type in your question there. Um, we do encourage the interaction. Wonderful. So we're going to get going now that everybody is using that chat feature, which is awesome. So today we're going to be talking to Meg Winnicates. Um, she's actually a NEMA staff member here in the office about writing and recharging. Um, so Meg, so it looks like we're good to go. So if you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about yourself and what we're going to be talking about today. All right, because everybody loves introductions. So. Thank you, Heather. I'm Meg Winnicates. I'm Membership and Advocacy Manager here at NEMA. Um, I'm also a published poet and author. And uh, one of the topics I like talking about most is about writing in museums and kind of the importance of keeping a creative practice to stay inspired. This is a really creative field that we work in, which is fantastic. Sometimes it's actually a little too creative and it can kind of take all of the energy that you have up for your personal creativity. Um, I've certainly been in that space before and so I felt like it would be a really fun and interesting thing to get to talk about ways you can kind of work on your own personal creative practice within your own museum and the benefits that that can offer on both sides, both the museum serving as inspiration and your own kind of creative habits helping to remind you why we work in museums in the first place. So to start, I wanted to talk about the, the practice of creativity and this idea that basically the more you use creativity, the more of it you have. And no matter what it is that you do, whether you're an exhibit designer or an educator or an administrator, there's creative thinking required in the museum field. Um, and being able to kind of take a step back from the day-to-day to-do -to -day to list can be really helpful to just kind of shake up your thinking, whether you're just taking time for yourself or you're taking a creative break as a group. And it can really bring new energy to your job and, again, remind us why it is that we all work here in um, the museum field. And I see there's a question about PowerPoint or PDF available. The presentation is going to be recorded afterwards, so you'll be able to access it from the NEMA website if you want. I'll also be putting it up on my blog, which is brainpopcorn.com. So yes. <laughs> Practicing Creativity. One of the um, books that I go back to for inspiration from time to time when I'm feeling like I've just gotten too much into the daily grind is Carrie Smith's How to Be an Explorer of the World, the Portable Life Museum. And she started with this list where she was just brainstorming, how is it that you basically stay curious, which is a thing that I feel is incredibly important. So this idea that we should always be looking and that everything is interesting if you only look closely enough at it is I think really important and a real touch point for the museum field, right? We're based on this idea that everything is interesting and people ought to get to spend time with it and get to know it better and have reactions about it and develop some kind of personal connection to the objects and the stories that we steward. Um, so for instance, on a day like today, which is gray and otherwise uninspiring, I flipped open the how to be an explorer of the world to a page that says exploration 25 water study and document shapes made by water seems very appropriate given the amount of rain that's been falling in the last couple of days find as many as you can research shapes made by water and come up with new ones so i expect when i go out for a walk later today i will be thinking about that i don't have the advantages that you guys have of being working in an actual museum the nema office is a little short on visual interest, um, but there are still plenty of interesting things. And so working in a museum, you have 
the advantages of all of those great and inspiring things surrounding you every day. Um, so the kind of creative habit that I'm going to be talking about today is called ekphrasis, and I'll be getting back to that in a moment. But before I do, I wanted to check in with people and see who has creative hobbies if you've got a side gig. And you should be able to pick as many of those as apply to you, but I'd love to get to hear from you what kinds of creative practices you already engage with. Heather, did I get the poll right? Yes, it looks good. Um, we're about halfway finished with people Great. coming in. It's actually cool to see how many people are, uh, they do have a creative hobby. I think we're um, pretty good right now. We're at 21 out of 24, so I will um, end the voting now. All right. Excellent. And so the details for everybody else to see, writing was 45%, visual arts is 37, craft is 44, 45, and then performance arts is 25. And then I used to, but I don't really anymore, is 20. Um, way more hobbies and time is 12, and looking for inspiration is 20. All right, excellent. Well, your museum is chock-a-block with inspiration, whether you realize it or not. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Whoops. Whoops, sorry, Meg, that was my fault. <laughs> there you go. OK, thank you. <laughs> All right. so. Ekphrastic art is art that's created in reaction to or inspired by another piece of art, and frequently it crosses forms. So while people do create paintings inspired by photographs or things like that, it's more frequent that you end up with, say, a poem inspired by a painting or a piece of dance inspired by a sculpture or a theatrical piece that's adapted from a piece of literature, etc. Um, so that spans everything from the widely accepted, you know, every piece of biblical or Greek mythological art created in the Renaissance to the more modern creating of fan fiction and fan art inspired by popular culture. It's all a valid art form. Um, and if you go looking in your institutions, you will find some inspiration yourself. So one of the most famous examples of ekphrastic art is the Musée des Beaux-Arts by W.H. Auden. So it's inspired by a painting that hangs in the Musée des Beaux-Arts, which is the art museum in Brussels, Belgium. And he wrote this poem inspired by this painting. And it was one of my first experiences of ekphrastic art. Um, I had the opportunity to live in Belgium for a while when I was a kid, and my parents took me to see this painting, and my mother recited the poem standing in front of the painting. Um, so, and I've just been kind of fascinated ever since. So this verse that he says about in Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. So in ekphrastic art, there's this kind of conversation that's happening where the experience of looking at something is materially altered by the addition of someone else's viewpoint. So. I think this is something that people who work in museums are especially well suited to. Um, this is one of my own attempts. Uh, it's a an ekphrastic collaboration between my cousin, who's a photographer, and myself. So this is one of our published pieces where we paired two of her photographs, and then I wrote a poem that basically helps tie those two together. So that one's published on Window Cat Press with a couple of others if you're at all curious. Meg, and I for do those have a, you, yes. a question that came in. Um, does a definition extend to the sciences too? That's a really great question. So thinking about art that's created inspired by scientific discoveries or objects, is that the question? Or science inspired by other science? <laughs> 
Joanna is typing. Um, both. <laughs> both. All right. Um, well, I think the, you know, science inspired by other science is basically just defined as the scientific process and the pursuit of knowledge. But um, art inspired by science is definitely a thing that exists. And since you can definitely argue that there is inherent beauty in certain scientific discoveries, such as, say, a poem written inspired by a photograph taken from the Hubble Space Telescope, I say absolutely sure. Why not? Um, it might have another name that I'm not familiar with other than ekphrasis, but whether it does or doesn't, I say it counts. Dan All right. Is also you Dan. Some other, yep, he's giving you some other ones there. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. So for those of you who are sitting here skeptically saying, but I'm not the sort of person who writes poetry. I'm not one of those, you know, 44 people who said they write in the original poll. Um, that's totally fine. You don't have to consider yourself a poet to write poetry. You do not have to feel like, you know, I studied this in college and I've been writing every day or any of that nonsense because poetry just as an exercise is a really useful mental break. Um, so trust your own creative instincts and your own sense of inspiration. And for those of you who are concerned about form and function of a poem, there are a lot of poetry forms that can be really useful if you don't feel super comfortable with the entire idea of writing poetry. Um, Found poetry is one that works really, really well in the museum setting. I've done a lot of found poetry with museum labels. So if you go into a gallery and you just wander around and write down a list of all of the words in the labels in that gallery that stick out to you and really appeal and use that as your word list to construct your poem, that's fantastic. Um, erasure poetry is another version of found poetry where you can basically take an existing piece of text and you black out the words you don't need and only keep the ones that work for you and create a poem that way. Deeply detailed description using all the senses is a fantastic way to start a poem. Lists are also good. Um, thinking about comparisons, you know, the typical simile and metaphor options, but even just um, more straightforward comparisons, you know, larger than this, smaller than that, deeper than this, etc. Um, my favorite example of that is Emily Dickinson's The Brain is Wider Than the Sky. Um, the brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. Um, question poems are also fantastic. Just sort of sit there in front of a something and write down as many things as you wonder about that as the base for your poem. Or think about who created it, what it might have to say if you could be in conversation with whatever that object is. So dialogue and personification, thinking about concrete to abstract, start with some detail you notice and work outwards from there. Um, Billy Collins is a fantastic poet for doing things that start concrete and go really crazy places and end up with talking mice and heaven only knows what else. Um, haiku are a short, intense form that work really well for responding to other kinds of art. Um, and I like to consider rhyme and meter as being black tie optional. So if you're really into formal poetry, that's great. But if you'd rather turn up to poetry wearing your jeans and a t-shirt, that's cool too. So um, for an example of someone who was deeply in love with ekphrastic poems is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, I used to work at the Longfellow National Historic Site, so he's always one of my go-to poets. So he wrote ekphrastic poems inspired by a lot of different things, some of them being the more typically expected paintings and photographs, but he also wrote, wrote about everything from a pen to a performance to a piece of furniture sitting in his study. So if you can get inspired by something and pull out an artistic idea, it doesn't matter where you start. So if you're working in a historic house, if you're working in a science museum, if you're working in a children's museum, there are still great options out there. You don't have to be working in an art museum to 
participate in an ekphrastic writing activity. So your task, if I can get the slides to cooperate, oops. Hey, Heather? You were on slide 10 there. Did you want me to go back? I do need to be on slide 10, but it's not showing on my screen. It appears to be frozen. You keep I'll just moving to 11. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not no, doing, okay. I'm not touching anything right now. <laughs> My screen's still showing page nine, so sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, you are on 10. Um, is your coworker Press PJ's two. computer up? <laughs> All right. Great. Your task, find your art. I'm just going to watch along with BJ. Um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. So, after this webinar, I would like to invite you to go out into your space, whether that's a gallery, some room in your house, anywhere else that you're going, you know, pull a book off the shelf if you work in an archive or a library, and brainstorm a list of words and phrases that come to you while you're looking at this thing. Um, take photos for future reference if you want to be able to look back at it later on if you don't have a huge amount of time during you know, your next coffee break. Um, then take your notes to your favorite thinking spot, whether that's back to your desk or out under a tree or home on your couch with a cup of tea. Um, and then revise as necessary, refine it however you like. And thinking about, yay, my screen's not frozen anymore. All right, thinking about ways to get at that um, for those of you who teach visual thinking strategies um, in your various museums, that's a really good place to start just for ourselves as well as working with a group of students. Thinking about what do you see? What makes you say that? What does it remind you of? Um, and also be aware on a deeper level of what are your reactions to this thing? Why does it speak to you positively, negatively? what associations do you have with it and what kind of sense do you have about the artist's choices, your reactions to the artist's choices and what avenues that might lead you down. Um, possible connections you could be making between yourself and whatever object you choose would be thinking about themes, talking about the visual qualities of whatever it is that you're looking at, thinking again about those emotional reactions things that it might resonate with, either something out of your past, something to do with an artistic or a literary tradition you consider yourself part of, thinking about historical context, um, using the object as a metaphor or a frame for, say, that historical context or for that tradition, um, and thinking about timelines. You know, where does this fit? What does, you know, what was it the cause of? What was it the effect of? What does it represent? So we are going to try something a little unusual for a webinar, though I do this in my poetry workshops in person all the time. And I'm going to give you a writing prompt. So you are going to have five minutes to look at the following slide and to brainstorm, to doodle, um, to draft whatever you like. Um, if you are more of a sketching person than, the, than a writing person, please feel free to sketch. Um, I often find that sketching something helps me remember it in a more visceral way than taking a photograph of it in order to go back to it later. Um, when the next five minutes are up, um, I'm going to invite you to share any favorite phrases you came up with while you were looking at this piece um, and type them into the chat box so that other people can enjoy as well. So here we go.
All right, and that is five minutes. So I hope you all had a chance to really look closely and give dedicated attention to this piece of art. And if there are any of you who have a couple of phrases that you're particularly proud of that you'd like to share um, and would like to type them into the chat box, we would love to get to see them. So I'd also be really interested in hearing any comments people have about kind of the experience of spending five concentrated minutes looking at a single thing. What was it that caught your eye? All right. Thank you so much to Jan and Mick and Clara and Dan for jumping in with some of your favorite words. Blew Kristen away a little bit with the um, white noise generator. Sorry about that. These are fantastic. Sorry, what? Read some of them? Did you want to read some sure. of them? All right, I'd be happy to. So we've got Claire says, looking past the cracked shade into the empty field of memory. Tegan says, moth wings, which are lace, which are a curtain. The title is Wind from the Sea, but I don't see a sea. Rippling gauze and sunlight reverently sinking into the day, says Jan. And yes, the static in the background was not actually static. It was a white noise generator for wind and waves. I apologize if it didn't come through cleanly for everyone. And the curtains reminiscent of seaweed billowing in the sea. Thank you, Joanna. Ooh, veil and vinyl mediating expansive space. Nice alliteration, Pamela, that's really cool. All right, so please feel free to keep typing in phrases if you would like. Um, Lindsay got into the whole personification thing with the whole narrative with the questioning, that's awesome. So thinking about where you go next from here, um, redefining and redirecting with your poem thinking about if you're happy with where you started, where do you go from here? Um, this looks a lot like the same kinds of steps you probably take when you're doing writing of exhibit labels or marketing copy or anything like that. So it takes a certain amount of practice. It takes having conversations with people. You know, If you are open to sharing some of your writing, um, like Ellie went the very sensory idea, salt air, cool pine, and meadow grass hot in the sun. If you're willing to be sharing things like that, talking to people about what are the things that really caught your eye, you know, what was the most evocative phrase for you, and kind of refine it down into those pieces and then build it up again from there. Um, in poetry, we're always looking for the punchier word and the more succinct phrase, thinking about you know, how can we say as much as possible in as little as possible? That whole Emily Dickinson idea of if it blows the top of my head off, I know it's poetry. Um, and again, how is it that doing a poetry writing exercise can help you in your daily museum practice? Well, I mentioned exhibit labels, thinking about marketing copy, thinking about program ideas and what kinds of descriptions you're using in order to, you know, evoke a feeling if you are leading a tour. Um, what are the kinds of reactions you're hoping to get from museum visitors and what is it that we can be doing to be as poetic as possible in our storytelling. Um, and again, I find doing this kind of thing always reminds me why it is that I wanted to go into museums in the first place. Part of it was curiosity, because I wanted to know what was behind all those staff-only doors. And part of it was just the sheer breathtaking wonder of the kinds of things that we steward. So, and 
I gave BJ beach hunger with the prompt. Sorry about that, BJ. Time to go see the sea. Um, you can also take an activity like this and be doing it with your visitors. Um, in my role as a museum educator in previous incarnations of my museum career, um, I did a lot of poetry both in exhibit design and in programming. So thinking about ways you can actually incorporate poetic uh, prompts or quotes into your labels, um, into interactive elements, things like that. Um, you can be having poetic prompts as a way to get visitor feedback if you have a kind of evaluation station or a feedback board or one of those things where you're asking people questions and inviting their responses. You can put that in the form of a poetic prompt. Um, you might get fewer responses, but you're likely to get more thoughtful ones. Um, you can also be thinking about doing some of the very same prompts we just did as programs with your audiences. Um, doing the found poetry in a gallery works fantastically with student groups, um, particularly middle school and above, inviting them to take other people's words and build from them to create something of their own is a really great tie-in between the literary arts and the visual arts, for instance. Um, it's great for intergenerational groups because you can get older visitors to help younger visitors to write down the things that they're reacting to and create a collaborative poem. Um, it's great with adult learners because, as many of you yourselves were saying, we're always looking for inspiration and to kind of get back into that creative place that maybe the daily life doesn't let us do. So lots of good options for ways to do this with visitors. So at this point, um, I would love to get to hear any reactions people have, suggestions for um, Oh, we've got a question here from Gina. How would you structure the found poetry using labels? So you need to do a certain kind of introduction to whatever group it is that you're working with to introduce the idea. Talk about kind of finding inspiration or themes within a gallery. So tell people to, say, pick three objects, for instance, that really appeal to them and go have a look at those objects, maybe write a list of their own words, have a look at the label, pull out the words and phrases that really speak to them, and then take those two word lists and combine them together to create a poem. Um, that's the way I've done it, but there are probably other alternatives as well to doing a found poetry exercise like that. Um, giving them a certain amount of free choice helps. Um, you don't necessarily want to say, everybody look at this one piece the way I just did <laughs> um, and you know write a reaction to it because if you have the ability to give people a little bit more freedom to choose, they come up with the most wonderfully creative stuff. So, all right. Any other questions, results, or reactions at this point? All right. Joanna says the Eckhart method could work, which is not actually one I'm familiar with. But if Joanna, you'd be willing to type in a brief explanation or a link into the chat box, it would be fantastic if you would share that with folks. In the meantime, I have always thought about finding where the breeze came from, inspired by the painting we were looking at earlier. All right. Thinking about more visibility to questions and poetic responses within a gallery. Visibility is a really good question. I think probably it really depends on the restrictions of whatever space you're working in. Um, I'm not an exhibit designer myself, so Nick or some of the other folks on the 
webinar might have other suggestions, they could be typing into the chat box as well. And um, I would say that you can encourage people to write poems if you put more examples up there of things that are accessible. So if you've got a couple of ringers on staff that can write some poetic responses or have sort of poetic favorites that they feel like really apply to whatever the theme is that you're asking for feedback on, that can be really helpful um, because just sort of throwing it out there like write us a poem is really intimidating. Um, there are a lot of people who just they have a natural reserve about that kind of thing. So if you put a few things out there that are quotes or examples uh, from other folks to make it seem less intimidating and more of a reachable goal, I think you would get more responses. Um, Dan says, describe the museum stage experience and how that compares with poetry. All right, so for folks who are not familiar with Museum Sage, um, Dan had the entire NEMA staff do a field trip recently, um, and we had two guides who are trained in the Museum Sage technique, which basically um, is kind of um, half oracular, half meditation. So you, by chance, get led to an object and you're contemplating a life question. Could be simple, like what color should I paint my bedroom? Could be much more serious about like what direction should I be taking my career or things like that. And you look at a piece of art and go through a sort of set of leading questions that allow you to think about how this artwork and what you're seeing from it might reflect on whatever your life question is. So I would say it's got a lot of similarities since one of the touch points is intense visual description and one of the other touch points is emotional reaction. So both of those are things that are great jumping off points for poetry. Anything that demands intense concentration is going to be useful for creativity. Because um, the more you work at noticing things, the more things occur to you. So it's part of why I named my blog Brain Popcorn. One idea sparks another, sparks another, and then you've got an entire pot full of all of these interesting ideas. Kind of like when a popcorn machine starts to pop and you have one or two solitary kernels, and then all of a sudden your bowl is overflowing. So. Museum Sage worked much the same way for me that writing ekphrastic poetry does. Um, all right. Louisa says, erase your poetry. Um, you've actually printed out copies of the labels to use as basis for the poems to circle or cross out the words. That's a great way to do it, especially with younger students um, where they can read, um, but possibly their writing skills are slower. So it also demands less um, because Basically, the words are left in whatever structure they were originally, and all you're doing is getting rid of the excess. Um, ideally, if you're writing very poetic labels, they're not blocking very much out. But <laughs> if you've got a lot of excess, that's a really great way to figure it out. Um, and only the words that stand out to them are the things that are left. It's a great kind of evaluation tool for exhibit label writers, too. Um, biography of an object is another recommended one that's great. Um, very good for historic objects, that whole question mark of who did this belong to, where has it lived, what has it seen, all of that kind of thing. It's a great personification option. Um, all right. And Lindsay says you can actually start with a poem um, about, say, a battle or a historic event and talk about the meaning behind the poem and what the students are getting from it. That's also a really great way to start. Um, poetry has, of course, all of that lovely poetic license to it. So talking about the difference between a personal reaction to something and historical record is interesting. Um, when I worked at the Longfellow National Historic Site, we had plenty of people who were annoyed that the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere is not actually historically accurate. <laughs> and wanted to know what Longfellow thought he was doing. And when you tell them that actually he was writing a poem about the Civil War and using Paul Revere as a metaphor, you get to a much more interesting discussion than you might otherwise. Um, so starting with a poem and 
breaking that down and talking about it is also a great way to do it. Um, Jack Perlutsky has a fantastic book for kids called How to Eat a Poem, which is a great way if you don't feel super comfortable with analyzing poetry yourself to start thinking about ways to read poetry, particularly with kids, if that's something you're interested in incorporating into your museum education. Um, speaking of which, options for further reading. Uh, back when I was talking about forms of poetry for non-poets, these are some examples of poets who do this so much better than I do. Um, so uh, Shirt is a fantastic example of both list poetry and providing historical context because Robert Pinsky goes from describing you know the collar and the cuffs of this shirt to talking about everything from the um, Triangle Shirt Factory fire to the slaves who picked the cotton to create the shirt and all of this kind of thing. So it's a list poem, it's intense visual description, and it's historical context all at the same time. Um, My Last Duchess is a brilliant example of kind of personification and dialogue around an imagined ekphrastic experience looking at a portrait. Um, Some Questions You Might Ask by Mary Oliver is, again, a great questioning poem. She goes from the concrete to the abstract and back again. Um, And again, most of these poems are worth a read just for the fun of it. Anne Hathaway is um, giving voice to um, Shakespeare's wife uh, in the famous I Leave My Wife, My Second Best Bed from William Shakespeare's um, will. So that's taking a historic document and imagining what does that mean? Like, what would Anne Hathaway have thought about having been gifted the second best bed? Um, turns out, of course, it's because the best bed was reserved for guests. So Carol Ann Duffy posits that the second best bed is actually the one that has all of the memories attached to it, because it's the one that Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway would themselves have slept in. Um, but it's a great kind of example of using a historic document instead of a visual object as an ekphrastic poem and giving voice to the voiceless through poetry, which is an awesome thing to do. Um, There are also some cool articles and uh, some books that I refer to frequently when I'm thinking about creativity and ekphrasis in particular. Um, So those are all fun reads. Um, And finally, thank you all for being here um, and for doing some creative writing with me over your lunch break. That was really fun. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. I would be happy to talk with anyone about writing in museums, poetic or otherwise. So please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, or I will have the slides up on my blog. They'll also be on the NEMA website. Does anybody have any other questions? If not, that's all I've got. Looks like more thank yous right now, which is awesome. Thank you so much, Meg, for doing this. It's a little bit different than our normal Lunch with Nima, but that's what we strive for with Lunch with Nima is doing something a little different occasionally. Well, thank you all. This has been a lot of fun. You were just called a rock star. (laughs) Quite a compliment. I'll take it. I also want to uh, mention our upcoming June uh, lunch with Nima will be on Kid Governor down in Connecticut, the Connecticut's old state house with Brian um, Co-Francisco. And we normally have lunch with Nima on the last Wednesday. So this upcoming lunch in June is actually going to be on Thursday due to scheduling conflicts. We really wanted Brian to talk about his program there and how it's applicable to school groups and working with teachers. So I would encourage you guys to attend the upcoming one. And also, we do have an archive of past Lunch with NEMA um, presentations. If you go to the NEMA website under Lunch with NEMA, you can see the recordings and past um, PowerPoint presentations. So if that is it, any last minute questions for Meg before we sign off today? Looks like we're good, Meg. And thank you again for everybody for joining us. And thank you, Meg, for um, talking with us today. All right. Go right, everybody. <laughs>